This is a 1952 Mac, and this is the only recycled garbage truck in North America. TSN's Motoring 96 is brought to you by Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life, and Midas, the way it should be. It's no secret that the fastest growing market in North America is comprised of sport utilities and light trucks. In fact, in 1994 in Western Canada, six trucks were sold for every four cars. Now it's also not news that very few of these vehicles are ever taken off road. Now that may frustrate the men and women who design these systems, but as we've discovered out here in British Columbia, the world's number one producer of tires sees the situation as a golden opportunity. I never understood the tire kick test, but for many consumers, it's the closest they ever get to examining the rubber on their vehicles before signing the check. Having said that, companies like Goodyear believe their products are beginning to receive the attention they deserve. The, uh, the replacement market, as we look at it, uh, the consumers are becoming increasingly more educated. They're, they're more concerned about their, the tires that they put on their vehicles, and they take a lot more time in, uh, versus what they used to when they buy their tires. Uh, they shop more. They ask a lot more questions. They're far more educated than where they used to be. And as a result, uh, the consumers, in most cases, find the right tire for their needs. With that in mind, Goodyear looked at the fast-growing sport utility market, saw an opportunity, and developed the Wrangler Aquatrack. Well, absolutely, we see an opportunity here. We, when we polled all our consumers to find out what is the most important attribute you know, in choosing a tire, tread life is number one. But the number two is wet traction and as a result we have produced a tire to conform to what the consumers want. The attributes are smooth quiet ride, good wet traction and as a result we've developed the tire that that performs to those needs and it's the dual aqua channel that uh, really attracts uh, the attention to this uh, this product here. It has two center channels in the tire, and what they do basically is funnel the water through the tread pattern to provide excellent wet traction capabilities. We have two track channels, one where we have a V uh, channel groove and one we have what we call a U-shaped groove, and both of these act in different ways. One allows the water to funnel through in an off-road application, uh, the other one on pavements, and, and what both of them function really to do is just to funnel the water away from the tread footprint to allow a, a good, wide contact patch on the road. The, the Wrangler Aqua Tread is very unique in terms that we've taken this concept from our, our Goodyear Aqua Tread tire, which was originally launched back in 1991. And we've taken the, what we've learned in that launch to the light truck market. And right now it's very unique. We're the first in the marketplace to launch a dual aqua channel tire for the light truck market. Inside the bends, all occupants are coddled in the lap of luxury. The view forward is excellent with virtually no blind spots. The ride quality offered is quite simply second to none. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at Mercedes-Benz latest. This is the all-new E320, a vehicle that has been radically restyled. Or has it? If you look very carefully, I think you'll see images of the past reflected in this very curvaceous front end. 
The sculpted fenders and return to round headlights reminded me of the old gullwing design. Now that was a machine. The physical dimensions of the new E have been increased, meaning it is now longer, wider, taller, and features an extra one and a half inches between the wheels. The benefits of these larger dimensions are twofold. First, there is more head and leg room in all positions, and secondly, it has allowed the engineers to incorporate larger crumple zones, which obviously improves safety. There are three different engines offered in the new E-Class. There's a diesel engine, this 3.2 litre rated at 217 horsepower. Down the road, a 4.2 litre V8 rated at 275 horsepower. Now at the moment, all of these vehicles come with a four-speed automatic. At a later date, they'll introduce a five-speed. Now that with the V8 should make things more than a little interesting. Once the engine hits about 1200 RPM, the power comes on strongly and smoothly. Tromp the gas pedal and the auto box drops down a couple of cogs and away you go. The impressive part is the speed at which you accelerate from about 70k to highly illegal speeds. The other interesting aspect of the engine control system is that it uses drive-by-wire technology. This replaces the throttle cable with an electrical wire improving precision. Traction control is another standard item on all E-Class models. This system uses anti-lock brakes to tame wheel spin by braking the offending wheel. Trust me, this system will earn its money during winter. Gone is the old strut-type front suspension in favor of a double wishbone design that uses coil springs, gas pressurized shocks and a sway bar. The advantage of this new configuration is the precision of the wheel positioning because there's no camber or toe change as the suspension deflects. The ride quality is quite simply second to none. The large stuff is swallowed in stride and the small bumps like expansion joints which usually filter back to the occupants don't. The handling characteristics are much better than average for a large and rather weighty automobile. The steering precision is also much better than the past model thanks to the adoption of rack and pinion steering. The brakes are of the four-wheel disc variety, feature ABS and one of the best pedal feels in the business. As such, it is one of the easiest pedals to modulate. The stopping power is strong, linear and completely fade-free. During the brake tests, I averaged 114 feet to stop from 80k. This new Benz has been very well engineered, but it's not without its shortcomings. First of all, the knee bolster sticks out too far and interferes with your knee as you go from the brake to the gas or vice versa. You can inadvertently set the cruise control, which is more than a little inconvenient. The illumination buttons for the dashboard, they're not illuminated, so you can't see them at night. And lastly, and I think potentially most dangerous, there's no oil pressure warning light or gauge. That's something that I think they need to address. Elsewhere, the Benz has a few nice surprises. There is a cup holder that rises up out of the center console, a first aid kit in the rear armrest, and a vent in the center storage bin to keep your egg salad sarnies cool on the way to work. In the rear, the occupants are treated to ample head and leg room. The trunk size is on the limited side, but does house a full-size spare. With the headrest in the upright position, rearward visibility is cluttered. However, not a problem, because they all fold flat at the touch of a button. The eight-way power seats come complete with three-position memories for both driver and passenger. They are also heated, both in the base and the lumbar region. The climate controls are easily operated and feature separate controls for driver and passenger and something called smog. When the system detects either carbon monoxide or nitrous oxide in the air, the system automatically switches to recirculating air to eliminate the pong. The dash is analog and readily viewed through the upper half of the wheel which, by the way, features both tilt and telescopic adjustments. On the safety front, the Big E scores well, with standard traction control, ABS and airbags for both front passenger and driver, plus side airbags in both front doors, as well as the usual paraphernalia. Well, that's it for the test drive on this Teutonic Temptress. The engineering is first rate, the execution excellent, notwithstanding my criticisms. The part I really like, though, is the focus they've taken with the styling. It started with the C-Class. It's very evident on this new E-Class. They've got it right, at least for my money, anyway.
We're going to leave this gorgeous scenery here in British Columbia and head to the garage in just a moment. But first, a couple of trivia questions regarding tires. Can you tell me which company pioneered the all-season tire and which company brought us the radial tire and when? We'll have the answers at the end of the program. Now let's head to the garage and join Bill. This week I want to talk a little bit about thermostats. The thermostat that controls the minimum operating temperature of your car's cooling system. What is it? Well, there's a thermostat that would fit this uh, four-cylinder Cavalier. There's what it looks like. It's located just underneath this housing right here, connected to the upper rad hose. And that's where it lives on most cars, although there are a few cars where the thermostat's located at the lower rad hose connection. Now, on this particular car, the thermostat lives underneath this water outlet housing, and to get at, you'd remove those three nuts. There's the upper rad hose, and it's the job of the thermostat to close off the coolant flow to the radiator anytime the engine's below a, approximately 195 degrees coolant temperature. Now, when the thermostat's closed, the water pump circulates the coolant around within the engine itself, but above 195 degrees, the thermostat begins to open, and the coolant flows out to the radiator in order to control the upper temperature of that cooling system so it doesn't get excessively hot. Now, remember, it's the job of the radiator to completely control the upper limit of the uh, cooling system operation. However, if the thermostat sticks closed, the engine will overheat quickly, usually within three to ten minutes after initial startup, depending on the size of the cooling system and the ambient temperature at the time. If the thermostat sticks open, the engine will run below 195 degrees Fahrenheit. You may not know it on all but the coldest day in the wintertime. Many GM cars, for example, give adequate heat from their heaters on all but the coldest days, even with a stuck open thermostat. In the process of tuning up and winterizing cars, I quite often find that thermostats are stuck partially open and the operator of the vehicle isn't even aware of it. That wastes a lot of fuel. It's an inefficient running engine that dirties its crankcase oil quickly and gives out very high exhaust emissions because emission control devices don't work properly. Properly. Now I've got an example of a partially stuck open thermostat right here. You can see through the core of this thermostat that it's going to flow coolant all the time because it's off the seat. Now that, uh, if, if your car has a temp gauge on the dash, you're going to notice that the temp gauge is going to be erratic and it's going to fluctuate depending on how hard you're driving the car and what the outside temperature is on, on any given day. When the thermostat's operating properly, the uh, temp gauge on the dash should wind itself smoothly and steadily up to a certain level peg and hold that level pretty consistently. Now if your car doesn't have a temp gauge on the dash and just a, a temperature warning light, you may not be aware of a partially stuck open thermostat. You could waste a lot of fuel before you finally realize that your heater performance maybe is down. Many of today's cars give adequate heater performance on all but the very coldest days, even with a partially stuck open thermostat. So have your mechanic check it. He can observe the coolant flow in the radiator, uh, measure the temperature of the coolant in the radiator after the engine's been running, or even just feel the upper rad hose after several minutes of operation to determine if you've got a stuck open thermostat. But hey, it's not a very expensive part, usually between eight and $24, and it's pretty easy to change. So if your car is more than three or four years old, you should start thinking about this part. It may be in a partially failed condition, wasting a lot of fuel. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 96. It was the first antique car show of its kind in Canada. Milton, Ontario's Cars in Motion 95 offered visitors a rare opportunity to actually ride in classic cars. The Ontario Agriculture Museum provided the backdrop for the two-day event. I think what sets our, our show apart is the fact that the, the visitors can ride around in the cars, hear about their history, and really enjoy the full flavor of, of these old cars. So many times you go to a show and there's static displays you look at and say that's nice, but this gives them an opportunity to go really back in time and, and uh, ride in the vehicles themselves. It's a 1939 Ford Beckel bodied fire truck. Paid a little under 5000 for it, and uh, it wasn't very pretty when I got it. Completely rebuilt the truck, and uh, we value it at around 30000 now. It's a Ford, and I'm a Ford lover, so that was the first thing, and I'm also a firefighter since 1956, so there was the dual things. It originally it didn't have the front mount pump, which you can see is on the front of the truck. This was installed approximately in 1953, uh, and it originally carried 400 gallons of water and 
we now only have a 100 gallon water tank. You know, at, at 45, 50 miles an hour, there's a, a lot of people want to pass you, but uh, it's a, quite unique. You get a lot of horns, a lot of, a lot of thumbs up. Uh, you know, like a really rubberneck when, when you go by them. This is a 1952 Mac, and this type was made for the military. They never seen military service, so Laidlaw put a box on, and uh, this is the first rear end loader garbage truck that Laidlaw owned in 1952. It only does about 44 miles an hour, and it burns six miles to the gallon. And they only worked in the city because they were too slow for the highway. But they rebuilt it with Mac, and this is the only recycled garbage truck in North America. It's a 34 Lincoln. It has a 414 cubic inch motor, which isn't big. It only produces 50 horsepower. It's a V12, and then uh, it's very comfortable uh, doing about 55 mile an hour right now, the way it is. You know. This car was always chauffeur driven when it was new, when it was owned by the movie star. Ned Sparks, his right name is Sparkman. I counted up 181 different, what we call the silent movies, and he also got into the talking movies. Lincoln made the car itself, but then the body was made by the Brun Coach Company in Buffalo. So there's only about 15 made, but uh, at this point, there is no other one registered of this caliber. But in 1959, I was working at the uh, Fort Plant in Oakville on the assembly line and got my relief break and somebody had thrown away the old telegram newspaper. So I literally pulled a three-ton car out of the garbage can. No one will argue that Chrysler has been building some attractive vehicles since introducing the LH line. This success brought the company from the brink of extinction and helped lure North American consumers back to the domestic market. But with so much new product coming so quickly, there's always been the question of maintaining reliability. The Wall Street Journal has obtained documents that suggest reliability has been sacrificed. Warranty repair costs on Chrysler vehicles have jumped 48% over the past two years. According to the journal, Chrysler expects to spend $2.3 billion U.S. or $959 for each vehicle it sells in 1995. That's up from $767 a vehicle last year and $647 in 1993. While not pleased with the figures, Chrysler attributed the jump to extended warranty coverage. Chrysler replaced its limited warranty package of 12 months or 12,000 miles with coverage for three years or 36,000 miles. Ford and General Motors would not reveal their warranty costs. So why won't car companies release warranty data? What have they got to hide? More on warranties later in the show on Kenzie's Corner. Oh, and I wish this thing was still under warranty. It's time to update our long-term accent. The other day we took it into the dealership for its routine maintenance and to fix the two problems that we'd found. The heater cable for the air distribution vent has become disconnected. The other thing, the right side door seal has started to come away. Both relatively minor and they will be addressed when we go in for our 6,000 kilometer service. Oh, we did our 6,000 kilometer service, your own filter change, and it's uh, about $40. And the heater control was just a loose cable inside the heater control. And we fit and secured the loose door molding. And small items under warranty, and that's it, we're all set to go. Boy, those guys are fast. Next time we'll update you with the costs incurred to date. Our minus tip of the week concerns installation of a new thermostat. First of all, I want to destroy a very common myth. Many people still think that a thermostat has changed seasonally, that there's a summer stat and a winter stat. For many years now, cars have used a high temperature thermostat year round for best engine efficiency and low tailpipe emissions. Now, when you're replacing a thermostat, there's a few things that you should be aware of. On a car where the thermostat's installed horizontally like this, it usually doesn't matter where the thermostat goes from a rotation standpoint. But if, it, if the thermostat sits like this on its edge or vertically, 
Uh, you need to have a look through the core of the thermostat and find the tiny little bleeder groove or hole in that thermostat. Mark it with a magic marker as I've done here and install it at 12 o'clock. It should be at the very top position rotationally. You don't want it down at 6 o'clock or anywhere else. Put it up at 12 o'clock. That'll assist you in refilling the cooling system because as the coolant level rises in the engine as you're refilling it, it'll get all the way up and cover the wax pellet in the thermostat, immerse it in coolant so it'll work smoothly and properly. That's your Midas tip of the week. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. Earlier in the show, we mentioned that Chrysler warranty claims have gone up by 48% in the last couple of years. Now, does this mean that Chrysler quality is in the dumper? Or is it simply a reflection of the fact that Chrysler's warranty claim period is now longer than it was before? Well, you know me, I'm not going to get involved in any controversy unless I'm armed with all the facts. But it brings up an issue I've been thinking about for a long time. You know, every car maker brags about their quality. Some quote CAA statistics on how many owners would buy the same car again. Others quote J.D. Power customer satisfaction results. The truly desperate even quote Phil Edmonston's lemonade. But there is one accurate measure of car quality, and that's the car maker's own warranty data. I mean, if we really knew for a fact whether Lexus replaces fewer engines under warranty than Mercedes-Benz, or whether Chrysler fuel pumps blow up more frequently than Ford's, then we'd really know how well the car makers are doing. Trouble is, no car maker wants to give us that information. About 10 years ago, I asked a Chrysler PR official if they'd like to release this data to the press. He said he'd look into it, but nothing ever came of it. Now, it would take a brave car maker to be first to release these numbers. After all, no car maker wants to admit that they ever have any problems. And anybody who did release these numbers would look bad because we'd have nobody to compare it to. Only if all the car makers released the data at the same time would we have meaningful statistics. The alternative, of course, perish the thought, is government legislation. So how about it, car makers? Anybody out there with the guts to tell us how good you really are doing? Maybe it would take a brave pioneer like a Toyota or a Mercedes-Benz who really does build good cars. Or so they'd have us believe. I'm Jim Kenzie. Before we go, we've got the answers to our two trivia questions about tires. The questions were, which companies brought us the all-season and the radial tire? Well, it was 1975 when Goodyear introduced the all-season tire, and it was way back in the 30s when Michelin brought us the radial tire. How about that? That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. We now are now making cars that uh, respond to the needs of our customers. Uh, we're doing that cost-efficiently. Uh, we're doing it quickly, and we're doing it well. I always say to our chairman that, you know, this is your home market, even though we're 3,000 miles away from the mother company. Uh, we sell, of the 40,000 cars Jaguar builds a year, we sell more than half. We're using the uh, 900 turbo three-door sedan, and that's uh, actually quite standard. We have done nothing but uh, increase the tire pressure. That's all we do. TSN's Motoring 96 has been brought to you by Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life, and Midas, the way it should be.